Amen. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning in the Lord's house. We're excited about what God has to say to us today. We're thankful that he brought you in. If you're a guest with us, we're extremely grateful for your presence and want to welcome you and encourage you. Right now, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to join me in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we have today to worship and adore you, to celebrate you, to proclaim testimonies of all that you have done in our lives. Lord, as we lift our voice to you in praise, we will be lifting you on high, but we will also be giving testimony of, of who you are, what you have done. And Lord, may our worship and may our testimony be a blessing to you. Thank you for each one here. Thank you for the guests who are here this morning, for the family that you have united here as First Baptist Church. Lord, we look forward with great anticipation and excitement to what you have to say to us this morning and to what you're going to do through us in the coming days. May our worship honor you now. Find us faithful in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mike.
We serve a great God, don't we? Amen. Let me read from Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's stand together and sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Please join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for allowing each one of us here today that we can come and honor and worship and, and magnify all the, the blessings that you have given each and every one of us and that we'll, all that we do will be pleasing in your sight. In your son's name we pray, amen. I invite you to sing with me. Give us clean hands and take my life.
Father, we do pray today that you would take our heart and our mind and our wills and transform them uh, into what you want, Father. Lead us and guide us and help us to hear your word today from your servant. Thank you for this time that we can gather in your house today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope, I hope this morning that that's your prayer, that God would give us clean hands and pure hearts, that he would take and mold and shape us into who he desires us to be. Probably one of the greatest challenges we face in our, in our worship is our lack of expectation. And we've talked a little bit about this before, but, but I want you to consider right now, in this moment, right here, what are you here for? It is very easy to allow ourselves to get into the habit, good habits, but to get into habits that don't make a huge impact on our lives. Spending time in God's Word on a daily basis is a great habit to have. But when you do it, you've got to engage with Him, recognize His presence, and allow Him to speak to you. Being in Bible study on Sunday mornings in, in a Sunday school class is a great habit. For those of you who aren't a part of one of our Bible studies on Sunday mornings, I would encourage you, come and check them out. We've got a class that will fit you. But come and see what God wants to do. But again, if it's just coming out of habit without any expectation, you're going to miss out on a lot. And this morning, as you came into this sanctuary, a place where we worship and honor God, if you came out of habit without any expectation, you're going to miss a whole lot. So stop right now and just consider that. Consider what it is that you're expecting today. Because you see, we can get into the habit of doing things and forget that God is with us right here, right now. This is all about Him. We sing and we make a joyful noise unto the Lord because of His presence here among us. We enter into His Word this morning because God has something to say to us. And if you can have an expectation that when you leave this place this morning, God will have had something to say to you, and you will determine to say something back to Him, then get ready for a great ride. Because that's what God wants to do. Last week, we focused on three changes that Jesus brought relating to the priesthood, relating to the sacrificial offerings, and related to the location of the temple. We continue this morning with three additional changes brought about by the life of Jesus, his sacrificial offering on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. Changes that were brought for us. And when I say changes, again, I'm referring to the fact that God established from the beginning certain things. And we read through the Old Testament. The Old Testament is important to us. We need to understand it. We need to embrace it. We need to pursue it. But there are a few things that when Jesus came, changed from Old Testament to New Testament. Our introductory passage last week was about Jesus coming to fulfill the law and the prophets in Matthew 5.17. This morning, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5.17. So take your Bibles, open them up to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Paul, Paul writes in this passage 
of the reconciliation that Jesus brought, which will lead us to further items of change that he brought. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 17, if you will follow along as I read from the Word of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Would you pray with me? Father God, you have been active throughout history, and you continue to be now. You have revealed yourself in a variety of ways, through miracles, through individuals, through creation, and most of all, through your Son. May we fully understand this morning but more than understand, embrace and engage in what you have done through your Son for each one of us. Help us to see, Lord, how we are to live daily. Help us to understand the impact you want to have on our lives, how you want to be vitally important to us, how you want an intimate relationship with each one of us on a daily basis, Lord. Speak to us through your word. Help us to understand it this morning. And help us to be changed because we've been in your presence. We ask it in the power and the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we stated last week, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. This verse also follows that line of thinking in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. Throughout history, God has used his chosen people to reveal himself to his creation. With the coming of Jesus, with his death, his burial, and his resurrection, God's desire is to reconcile us to himself. The witness and the testimony to bring this about has changed, though. He builds on some of the old ways and replaces others. God's desire is to reveal himself to the world. In the Old Testament, we saw how that was done. It was done through his chosen people, the nation of Israel. He showed the world who he was. And he continues to do that today through you and I. Let's look at three more things that changed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Changes that Jesus brought. Number four. We had three last week, so we're picking up with number four. The Lord's Supper. We've talked a little bit about this, but I want, I want to engage a little bit with this this morning. The Lord's Supper was established on the celebration and remembrance of the Passover. The Passover, as you will recall, was a celebration to remember the salvation that God brought to the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egyptian slavery. It called for specific activities which reminded the children of Israel what God had done to free them. The sacrificing of a lamb was an annual event for the children of Israel during Passover. Why? To remember the lamb's sacrifice in Egypt that saved the firstborn from death when the death angel passed through all of Egypt. So each year they would sacrifice this lamb 
And the whole purpose of this was to remember how God had saved them in Egypt, to remind them of his desire to save us. And so each year they would celebrate by sacrificing that poor little lamb. You know, the blood from that lamb in Egypt was sprinkled on the doorposts. But the meat of the lamb was also eaten, eaten in preparation for a long journey that they didn't even realize they were about to take. Then we also have the unleavened bread, which was a reminder of the urgency with which they departed Egypt. There was no time to get the leavened bread ready for travel because God said, get up and go now. And they left. And so each year they would celebrate and remember what God had done. I want you to know that Jesus undoubtedly had celebrated this event over 30 times while on the earth. But it was the last celebration of it that changed things. Turn over to Luke chapter 22, if you would, please. Luke chapter 22. Look down to verse 7. I want to read a couple of verses out of here and listen to what Jesus says. It says, Then came the first day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, so that we may eat it. Drop down to verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to each of them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. No longer... No longer was this event to mark the deliverance from Egypt, but to remember the sacrificial offering of the Son of God for the remission of sin for all man mankind. Jesus is now the sacrificial lamb, and his blood is our protection. His body is represented by the bread given for us. The deliverance from bondage in Egypt pales in comparison to the deliverance brought through the sacrifice on the cross of the Chosen One. It was a pale picture of what was to come. Jesus has now fulfilled that. That is our remembrance and our testimony in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. We may make reference from it or to it from time to time of the heritage coming out of the Passover. But we do not celebrate, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we do not celebrate the Passover. We celebrate what Jesus did. Do you see the difference? Do you see the change that he brought? New meaning to that bread. New meaning to that juice. It wasn't in reference to that little white lamb. It was in reference to to God's Son. And that is what must be our focus when we celebrate together the Lord's Supper. Number five, <clears throat> clean and unclean. In Old Testament laws, God gave the children of Israel specific laws <clears throat> of clean and unclean things. These laws were given specifically to set apart the chosen ones 
from the rest of the world. Listen to what it says in Leviticus chapter 20. It says, I am the Lord your God who has set you apart from the nations. You must therefore make a distinction between clean and unclean animals and between unclean and clean birds. Do not defile yourself by any animal or bird or anything that moves along the ground to which I have set apart as unclean for you. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Understand these laws that God gave in the Old Testament of clean and unclean were to distinguish God's chosen people from the rest of the world. It was a revealing action to identify them. Now, I want you to, I want you to catch something here because part of this continues on today. You and I are to be set apart. Holy is the word. Set apart for God's purpose. In other words, our lives are to reveal him. You have heard me say that time and time again. You will hear me say it over and over and over again because the truth of the matter is you and I are the revelation to the world of who God is. We need to take that very seriously. It's not something that we just encounter and move on with life. The reality is wherever you go, whatever you do, if you wear the title of Christian, knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you carry with that the revelation of who God is to the world. Now, in the Old Testament, God set them apart by giving them rules and regulations that they must follow. And the clean and unclean was one of those. There were foods that they could not eat. There were things that they could not touch. If they did, there was a ceremony of cleansing that they had to go through, a time period that they had to walk through before they were considered clean again. Jesus, listen, listen, if you will. I want to read out of Luke chapter 7 to what the words of Jesus in reaction to this law. Chapter 7, beginning with verse 5, is where I'm going to read. It says, The Pharisees and the scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to these traditions of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or his mother, Whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. After he called the crowd to him, and he said, again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things, all these evil things proceed 
from within and defile the man. Jesus was saying you don't understand why God gave you these regulations, why God gave you these laws. It was to reveal him to the world. It wasn't about you. There isn't anything that you take in that makes you unclean. If you are unclean, it is because what is coming from your heart. It is what you have set your heart and mind to that makes you unclean. Now, I've got to be honest with you. From a personal standpoint, I am so thankful that Jesus changed this because I love bacon. It is not what goes in that defiles us. That, that in itself is a revelation that really shouldn't be a revelation, but it is a revelation to us that we must embrace and understand. The devil didn't make you do it. It isn't the circumstances around you that caused you to do these wrong things. It is the desires of your heart that cause you to sin. It is the nature of sin that you allow to continue to be in control of who you are. That's what defiles us. That's what causes us to stumble and fall. Someone else's actions do not justify our sin. The devil made me do it is not an excuse. It is not even a truth. By the power of the name of Jesus, the devil cannot, is unable, is absolutely powerless to cause you to do anything. He was in the garden. Adam had the authority in that moment to look at the serpent and cast him out. God had said, I give you authority over all of my creation. Adam had the authority to do it. But when God came, you remember the story? What have you done? Well, I didn't. The woman you gave me, it was her fault. And immediately, without God even saying anything to her, she says, but it was that serpent you created. He's the one that caused us to do this. No. You have the power to do what's right. It is not what we take in. It is not any external circumstances that make the decision for you and I to act. And if we're going to be the revelation of Jesus to the world, we need to recognize how we act and what we do and what we say is vital. And we have the power and the ability to do what's right. Clean and unclean in your life comes from the desires of your heart, comes from what you invest your life in. What do you spend most of your life focusing on? What is it that draws you in? That's what you need to stop and look at. Quit feeding the monster if that's a problem and stand for what is true and what is right. It was never about making the man clean, but about the testimony of who the man was. In regards to the man being clean, that comes from the heart. Nothing you ingest will make you unclean. That comes from your actions based on your commitment. The old law revealed the commitment to the world, but today it is our actions of everyday life that reveals the commitment of our heart. God does not need us to have a set group of rules and regulations that we must follow, even though we as Southern Baptists are very well known for that, aren't we? From the outside world, people look at us and, and say, well, that, that's the group of do's and don'ts. You can't do this and you can't do that. Thou shalt not. God isn't concerned with the, the rules and regulations. He's concerned with the heart desiring to do what's right. And then number six, a new creation. You and I are meant to be the greatest change that Jesus brought. You are that change. 
The verse we started with, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, speaks exactly to that. The chosen of God were initially the direct offspring of Abraham. The new covenant, however, opens the door wide for all mankind. The whole purpose of God's chosen ones throughout the Old Testament was re to reveal himself to the world. Now, after years of the children of Israel being the, that revelation to the world, the world has an opportunity through Jesus to become the chosen ones themselves. I hope you recognize that you, as a follower of Christ, you are the chosen ones. Listen to this passage out of John. Let me get there, John chapter 1. Verse 11 and 12. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Now please hear me. I am not discounting Israel. But I need you to understand that things have changed. The descendants of Abraham are not the primary focus of what God is doing right now. It is those who have embraced his son, Jesus Christ. The descendants of Israel have a place. Scripture talks of that. But you and I, as followers of Christ, are the children of God, the chosen, set apart for his glory and revelation to the world right now. It is a new creation, and you and I are a part of that. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Is that you? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Then you need to recognize that it's a whole new day. You are the revelation to the world. God desires to use you to help others see who he is. The greatest change that Jesus brought was meant to be you. To show the world who he is, he provided salvation and deliverance of your life, that you can be the chosen one of God Almighty. Are you a witness of the creator of the universe? Does your life reveal a clean heart washed by the blood of the Lamb? Does it give hope to a lost and dying world? See, all of the other changes that Jesus brought were to validate you as a witness to God the Father. Have you recognized that? Have you received that? Church, my desire, but more so God's desire, is to see you empowered to live the life God has called you to do, to be that revelation. All of these changes, all six, are all about you and I becoming that powerful witness and revelation to the world of who he is. No longer do we have to go to a priest to communicate to God. No longer do we have to stand outside the Holy of Holies because God resides within. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. No longer is that sacrificial offering of a lamb 
or a dove. No longer do we have to make a sacrificial offering for the remission of our sins. Now our sacrificial offering is giving above and beyond what God has already commanded us for the support of His kingdom in our life, our talents, our abilities, our finances, in everything. We give sacrificially. No longer do we celebrate the Passover remembering the Exodus. Now we celebrate the Lord's Supper remembering the price that Jesus paid for each and every one of us. And no longer do we have to worry about what is clean and unclean as a testimony that we are set apart for God. It is our lives as a whole that reveals that. So I wondered this morning, are you empowered to live that out? I wonder this morning, do you know him intimately? If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, not know about him, but know him, then it's time to get that taken care of. Christian, are you living an empowered life as a revelation of him? If not, today is the day you can start that. Would you pray with me? Father God, right now in this moment, I pray that your spirit would move through this sanctuary, through each and every person here. Lord, help us to sense your presence in a powerful way. Help us to understand what it is that you're calling us to even now. Lord, there are some who are here this morning that have not received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. They have heard about him. They may know a great deal about him. But personally engaging him, seeking his forgiveness, and committing the rest of their lives to following that's what it's about. And so, Lord, I pray you would give them strength right now to deal with that issue, to choose to set the record straight today, to invite Jesus to come into their lives, to be their Lord and their Savior. Lord, I pray for brothers and sisters in Christ who are here this morning that have been living the life to the best of their ability. I pray that you would help them see it. it has nothing to do with their ability, but it's time for us to unite and to live empowered by the power of the cross, by the power of the resurrection, by the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ within us. Now is the time that we must seize the moment and begin living fully and completely in your presence. Father God, as we respond to you now in this time of invitation, I pray that each decision that is made, each testimony that is given, would glorify you and you alone. Thank you for your word. Thank you most of all for the changes that Jesus brought and for how you desire to be intimate with us. May it be so this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now is a time of invitation, a time when you can respond to God. God has been speaking to us. What is it that you have to say back to Him? What is it that you need to tell Him this morning? Know this. If you're here this morning and you haven't asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, there's probably someone close by who knows that. And right now, more than anything else, they're praying for you. They want to see your life transformed. Will you take that step of faith? Will you respond to what God is calling and asking of you this morning? Christian, are you living an empowered life? Is it time to make that decision? The altar is open if you want to come and pray. A couple of our deacons will be up here. You can grab one of them and pray with them if you want, or if you just need to talk, I will be here. Our deacons will be here. You come you do what God has asked you to do. If you want to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, we would love to help you make that decision this morning, answer any questions you have. 
Let's stand together as we sing, You Step Out and Come. So are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. a seat for just a moment if you would please I want I want to remind you that God hears and answers the prayers of his people I need you to hear that because God is listening and wanting to know your heart's desire and wanting to be involved in your life and even this morning in, in this time of invitation, God has answered prayers once again as he continues to do. I want to introduce you to a couple, a couple folks who have come forward. Darlene and Bruce, come on up here. This, this is Darlene McDermott. 
Darlene comes this morning knowing Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior, wanting to follow in believer's baptism and join this church family. So we will, we will get that set up and taken care of, and uh, we're looking forward to that celebration. And uh, I'm going to introduce another family. Parkers, come on up here. This is the Parker family, and they have been, uh, they, they're mo they have moved to the, I guess officially moved a year ago. Yes. Okay. Uh, to, the, to the neighborhood, and... Uh, um, we are so thankful that God brought them into our fellowship. They've been uh, here for, uh, well, quite a while now, coming and being apart. But uh, they got most of the family together today. We're still missing one son. But uh, they are coming this morning wanting to join this church family by letter as they come and, and plug into what God is doing here at First Baptist. So if you rejoice, will you just say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. All right. Let me say this. I'm going to invite them to go ahead, and you guys can go ahead and head back to the back in the foyer. You'll want to be back there. People will want to come by and shake your hand, hug your neck, welcome you to the family here. Um, let, me, let me say this. Our, our deacons will be up here. If, if God is working on you right now, don't get out those doors without doing something with what God is saying to you. If you need to follow in believers' baptism, we would love to celebrate that with you. If you've got questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ, asking him to be your Lord and Savior, these guys would love to talk to you about that, answer any questions you have. You can get that taken care of today before you leave this place. You want to join this church family? We are looking with great anticipation to those God adds to this family here at First Baptist because he's not through with us. He has got so much planned for us. We need each and every one of you to be a part your gifts, talents, and abilities are vital to what God wants to do here. So we want to count you as part of the family here. If you want to deal with that, you come up and talk with these guys before you leave, all right?